Yeah, so we're back with Kev and we're going to move on now, Kev, to the section in the course, which is to do with the kite mark. Okay, the kite mark. Um, the kite mark uh, the, with the BKC, uh, the goal behind the kite mark was to create a consistent approach uh, to produce, uh, for procedures and standards within ring sports in areas such as safeguarding and well-being, health and safety, equality, diversion and inclusion, coaching and refereeing and community engagement. And, and also, if you get the kite mark, it demonstrates that you go above and beyond the legal requirements to, to operate a gym. Okay. Um, now at this point, at this point within the seminars that have been done, I make everybody play a game and everybody has to stand up. And then, so I say, right, everybody stand on your feet, sit down if your club doesn't have the following. Instructor and public liability insurance, nobody sits down. Employees liability insurance, oh, no, I'm not sure about that. And so I say to them, if you're unsure, sit down. Right, I'm, I'm sure I'm all right with that. A valid first aid qualification, people sit down. Up-to-date risk assessments, people sit down. An accident book, people sit down. A coaching qualification in Muay Thai, everybody sits down. Okay? The following, all of those things, are the requirements of the 2015 Health and Safety Act. Okay? Now... People who call themselves crew or Arjan or anything like that, that doesn't mean you have a coaching qualification in Muay Thai. One of the reasons as well that we did this in, in the fact that I was so... It started in 2017 and I sort of put it out there and I was going to do this and I was going to do that was because the date of 2020 is really really important is incredibly important because from 2020 i don't know when the the, the the date comes in if you don't have a qualification in coaching you aren't allowed to coach kids kids and vulnerable adults so unless you're working with people who are 26 and above you don't need a coaching qualification so has anybody got a coaching qualification in muay thai the answer is no. They might have gradings. That's not a coaching qualification. You might have experience. That's not a coaching qualification. There are people like me. People like Dale White. There are people like uh, Lisa Horton Smith, off the top of my head. And there's, 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 there's lots of other ones as well who've got a background in education. I've got a degree in education and I've got coaching qualifications in umpteen sports, in football, in rugby, in basketball, in trampolining, in gymnastics, in dance, I'm a very good dancer, in dance, in, uh, in hockey. I've got literally everything you could imagine for teaching curriculum-based sport in school. And yet the only qualification I've not got is the sport of my choice. I don't have a qualification in Muay Thai. However, because I've got a degree in education, I can coach Muay Thai. Because my experience allows me to do that. In 2020, I don't know, as I said, I don't know the exact date yet. But it is going to come in in 2020. If you don't have a coaching qualification, you aren't allowed to work with kids. Which is a huge thing for us moving forward. Alright? So, people are thinking, crikey. I've not got that, I've not got that, I've not got that as well. There's about three things on that list I've not got. So then I ask everybody to stand up again. So now, <clears throat> ask them to sit down again if they, if they don't have the following. A DBS for coaches and volunteers. So you might have all your coaches, but is your Auntie Betty, who makes cups of tea, who's there for six hours who does six hours a week, or like me, for example, Lisa is the receptionist. Lisa has an enhanced DBS for the gym because she spends more than three hours a week at the gym. If you've got someone employable doing a job, or even on a voluntary role, if they don't have an enhanced DBS, they shouldn't be there. Do you have someone with a safeguarding qualification? If not, you shouldn't be opening. According to the... The, well, you'll see in a minute, 
if you don't have someone there, the safeguarding qualification, they may have done a safeguarding. Th this doesn't count as a case of safeguarding qualification, by the way. So this is safeguarding awareness, but not a qualification. If you don't have someone with a safeguarding qualification, you shouldn't be opening. Do you have a safeguarding policy for children and vulnerable adults? I do. <clears throat> I've got a file that thick at the gym. Yeah, and if you want to see it, any any parents or visitors who want to come in and see the paperwork that we've got in place, you can come and see it. If you don't have it, you shouldn't be open. Do you have a code of conduct for staff and volunteers? That's, as well, the coaching qualification in Muay Thai. That is, the coaching qualification and the code of conduct are recommended. They're not essential, they're not, but they're recommended. However, as I said, with the 2020, you need one. 2020, you have to have a coaching qualification. If not, you're not covered. Do you have a code of conduct for your performers, parents and visitors? Is there a safe recruiting policy? Everything separate to that is not essential. It's recommended. We've got all of those things. And those are the, the above requirements of the 2015 Children's Act. So if you've got a volunteer who works in your gym or comes and holds pads, you've got somebody who comes and does pads for a couple of hours a week, if they work two hours a week, that's fine. But if they're there three hours or more, they need an enhanced DBS. If you've got somebody who works on a on a part time basis, they may even be, they may even be a uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, a, a part time freelance coach. That's it. Part time freelance. They need an enhanced DBS. Now, when I worked in school, the parents, uh, the, the parents in school would never dream of going to the head teacher and saying, I want to see Mr. X, Y, and Z's uh, DBSs, and I want to see Miss ABC's DBSs, because the DBS is a private document, all right? The school's job is to recruit people. They need a safer recruiting policy for schools. Um, if there's an issue, they're not allowed to be because there's there's a barrier to the education because because in education the, 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 there's a barrier to entry. So paedophiles can't become teachers. Um, there are the, 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 there's something stopping you getting into the door. However, with Thai boxing, anybody can do it. Anybody can do anything. If I'll, I'll, I'll save it for a minute. So this is something that I use as well with the FA example. So if you want to uh, set up a club, you have to have a coaching badge, level one minimum, level two ideally. You need a first aid qualification, you need insurance, you need an enhanced EBS. You need to appoint your club's officials, treasurer, secretary, child protection officer. You need to purchase the kit and equipment because your kit can't clash with any other kit clubs in your league. You need affiliation to the county FA, and all of that has to be done before anybody kicks a ball. And that's just not football. There's all, all the 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 the, the, gov uh, the sports with governance. All the sports have got governance. The governing body, the county FA, then goes into the regional FA. And the county FA makes sure everything is is in check. And un unless you meet those uh, those requirements. You can't kick a ball. If you try setting up a soccer school and you don't have any of them, you'll be shut down. And the people who shut you down are the county FA. Now, we've got a situation is in Muay Thai, anybody can set up anything. There's nothing that stops a sexual predator opening a Muay Thai club. There's nothing that stops a sexual predator opening a judo club. Well, no, I'm going to retract that because judo is affiliated. Uh, say, like um, a kickboxing club. Because nobody cares. There's nothing in place. There are no barriers to stop that being enhanced. There's absolutely zero things in place. So, the thing that I would say, in my time, if I'm speaking to parents now, go up to the coach in your gym and ask them, can they see your DBS? Because if they can't, they might say, oh, I've got it at home. Right, okay, tomorrow, can you show me a DBS? Because you don't, your DBS is a private document. However, as a parent, you've got the right to see that. So if a parent is watching this now and asks, 
the coach at your gym that you're affiliated to, can I see your DBS? If somebody asks to see my DBS, I'll walk behind reception, I'll get my exceptionally large file out, and I'll go, oh, there you go. Now, I've got several DBSs. I've got from one when I was a teacher, which is a long time ago anyway. Um, I've got one from teacher. I've got one from being a member of the IBMTO. I've got one for the gym. I've got one for being a volunteer in my son's school. Uh, and the other one, I've got something else. I've got five. I've got five DBSs. And they were all date ordered, right? Um, they're all in different orders date-wise. Because, obviously, as soon as you have that DBS done, all that is a, is a snapshot in time of my criminal records up to that point. Okay? So... I may open a gym today and then tomorrow I go out and commit loads of crimes. That'll get flagged up on a DBS, which is why the DBSs need to be uh, updated very regularly, ideally in a three-year cycle. Um, if the DBS is dated sort of 10 years ago, then it's not worth the paper it's written on. Um, so there's nothing that stops a sexual predator opening a Thai gym. Zero, nothing at all. The, the um, frightening thing there, Kevin, what you what you just spoke about there, all that different criteria for gyms. In my opinion, it's safe to say probably half a dozen gyms, if we're lucky in the UK, meet all that criteria. Well, you'll know as well from when you do the open event. How many how many fighters turn up for the open? Four hundred. Yeah, three. How many how many inch how many licenses? Do you, do over, you, over ten percent of them. Over ten percent. So forty percent. And they come to the way in, and some of them are even. What's the license? Yeah. Now, we've had this a lot. New, new start gyms coming to us, asking, "Can you get us instructor insurance?" Well, yeah, I know, I know your history, daddy, daddy, da. But you need to check out member a member insurance. Oh no, we don't need insure. We don't need member membership licenses. And these. Dozens of gyms out there, Kevin, running without insurance. And if they're running without insurance, it probably means they've no instructor's insurance. Yeah. Surely the parents should be asking these questions. Yeah. As mandatory. Yeah. Well, DBS. If you, it, my, you, as a parent, it is a, as a parent walking in, yeah, it might look really nice, but it, uh, have they got insurance? Have they got a first aid qualification? If you walk in with, if you walk into my gym, all that information's up. Not the DBS. Because um, you can't, you're not really supposed to display no. them. But if you request mine, I'll show you it instantly, no problem at all. Um, but first aid qualifications, they should be on display. Um, and one of the things that I do within within the gym as well is, as you walk in, there's all this information up. So parents, even though they're not looking for it, they can see it. And they might not be looking for it initially, but they're going to see it the second time they come third. Oh, he's got that, they got that, they got that. And obviously, first aid qualifications have got an expiry date. Um, your, your insurance has an expiry date so you need to be checking that so because my gym's a big gym I have like facility insurance as well so I have uh, insurance for the classes but also I have like uh, I, have, I, I have cover insurance for like loss of earnings and if there's a bit of fire in the building and all this palaver as well so I, that's all up on the wall and if anybody walks in they can they can see that because it's behind reception and, it's in display the spread and the Sheet is on the screen now, Kev, with that tick list. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Go through it. And this is not scaremongering. No, no, no. And then that's not... And, and, is, and, and as well, this is not me. This is not me as well. And, and, and the whole reason I've been doing this is not me saying to people, well, you don't have this and you don't have this. Look at me, I'm dead clever. It's not that. It's protecting you. If you've not got insurance and somebody breaks their leg in your gym, you're, you're liable. You are personally liable. Yeah, I know that, Kev. It's the law. Yeah, all them, the criteria there that you've laid out in this presentation, and it's on the screens there, the yeah. tick list. The 2015 Health and Safety Act, 2015 Children's Act. If you've not got them in place, you shouldn't be opening. Local authorities will soon, well, it's been coming for a while, this, and um, local authorities, so they, they have something called MASH or Master Teams. Um, which is a result of the 2003 Children's Act, like a uh, common, common 
It's common assessment framework, like a multi-team approach to the police liaise with fire, the police liaise with social services, the police liaise with school, social services liaise with all these different groups to make sure that everybody's safe. So let's say, for example, um, there's uh, a broken leg at the gym and there's an uh, ambulance call to the gym and the, the paramedic goes in and he has a really bad feeling. Oh, that's awful. No. They were, they, were, they were training, and they were training Bershin, and they were kicking each other full of that Bershin. Well, I, I, I'm not sure about that. So what I'm going to do when I go back, I'm going to write a report, I'm going to refer that. So that then goes part of the report that goes in the MASH team. The MASH stands for Multi-Agency Support Hub. Multi-agency support team, depending on your area. And they meet regularly. So the police or the ambulance service, they'll have all different referrals will come together. And social services will sit together and they will all say, we've, we've, right, we've had this, this club here, this Thai boxing club. Uh, we had a broken leg. Then uh, we've had a report of someone uh, walking out with no shoes. We think there's a child being neglected there. Let's go and have a look at that gym. And if they come down, if the MASH team come down, and you've not got everything in place on the 2015 Child and Safety Act, if you've not everything in place in the 2015 Children's Act, they will close you. Nobody else. The local authority will shut you down. And that's where it'll come on from. They will probably... I'm not saying that you've not got... Let's say, for example, your, your, your first aid qualification has run out by two weeks. They're not going to shut you down. They're going to say, right, you need to sort that out. We've had a few... <laughs> we've had a few concerns about uh, about the club from this, 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 and we're going to come in to check everything's all right. Can you show us this? Can you show us that? They get your paperwork out. Oh, it's slightly bit all right. Just get that sorted and everything's fine. But if you walk in, if they walk into your gym and you've got none of these in place, then they're going to be having a professional conversation with you. And that's why everything needs to be done for this. As I said, this is not me saying, look at everything that I do. I'm really smart. I'm really clever. This has been done. This is being done, and you need to do it. If you've not got these things in place, they need to be done to make everybody safe. The kids in your gym, the vulnerable adults in your gym, everybody working safely together so that together as a sport, we can progress and move forward. Because we want Olympic recognition. We want everybody to be competing fairly and safely. But unless those things happen, they're not going to be able to. There's obviously... A, a, a seedy past in Muay Thai and kickboxing, in ring sports. There's been, there's been historical abuse cases. With, there's no place in society. There's certainly no place in our sport. And and it's up to us. We're the gatekeepers. You, me, the coaches, the parents. We're, we're we and the, and the kids. This is their sport as well. They've got a, They've got to respond. They've got to. Uh, we've got a duty occur to allow the kids to make sure that they're taking part in something that's safe. We've got to make sure that that, that matches are fair, that promotion is fair, that there's and so part one. Uh, I'll, I'll quick through this. It, um, you, why apply for the kite mark? Sorry, first of all, it shows that your club goes above and beyond. If you've got the kite mark, you've rubber stamped everything beyond the minimum section. Um, why wouldn't you apply for the car mark? Why wouldn't you get a D announced DBS? Why wouldn't you make sure that your insurance is up to date? Um, there's the head contact issue. Um, 18 months ago, everyone was like 15, 16, yeah. And then all of a sudden, more recently, there are more shows that I go to were 12, 13, 14. Well, 14 is it's 14. It used to be within uh, the IBMTO was 15 and above for head contact. Uh, next year, probably if next year we're having a meeting with the RBMTO, it's probably going to move to 16. However, that's not been voted on yet by uh, the other directors. Uh, but it, it looks like that that's going to go the way. I know that the WTK, they won't do contact, head contact from 16 and above. When you consider that you've got to be 16 to buy a knife, you've got to be 16 uh, to buy cigarettes. Or is it 18? No, I can't think. No, I can't remember. But it used to be 16 to buy cigarettes. But you've got to be 16 to get a dangerous job. So you can go in the army. But you've got to be, you can be 15 and get punched in the head, get CTE, you can get con concussion, you can get uh, forced trauma brain injuries. You've got to be 16 to smoke, 16 to do a dangerous job, 16 to buy a knife. Th there was a big report as well, um, the, the full report, um, 
I'll, I'll forward it to you so you can put this on for, you, for, for the screen for everybody. There was a, a, a consultant called Giles Critchley, who was a neurosurgeon. On the 8th of April 2016, he wrote a report to the Karate Union of Great Britain uh, regarding concussion in school sport and specific relation to martial arts. And I'm going to read this. Bear with me while I read it. And he wrote, now bearing in mind, this is a, a neurosurgeon, okay? My opinion isn't going to... If, if I get taken to court, and, and the reason I'm saying me get taken to court, because let's say, for example, if, if someone's going to prison over somebody dying, so, for example, the Scott Marsden thing, the line of, the line of blame goes referee, doctor, promoter, parent. Referee. So, I agree to do the 15 year the 14 year olds guys doing head contact right however all the 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 evidence out there and all the the data out there says really we should be 16 and all the groups are saying 16 and if the IBMTO next year go to 16 which i think they will then everybody all the major groups are doing and if people are doing exception from that then fair enough but in 2016, Giles Critchley wrote, Morally and ethically, it is not possible to justify teaching children any sport which allows full contact blows or kicks to the head due to the inevitable brain injury that will occur. Any organisation that does sanction this would need to clarify its legal position in view of the significant evidence of the long-term effect of head injury, including concussion, and the informed consent of its participants. Okay? So, if all the bodies are doing 16 and other people do 14, 13, 12, those people are putting themselves in the firing line should something negative happen because they will come in and they will shut it all down. And that referee, that doctor, that promoter, that parent, in that order, will face legal proceedings. Because if a failure of duty occur, and if there's a death of a child as a result of it, that's the order in which they'll be prosecuted. I'm going to go back as one of the, the final things I'm going to say to, and I get, and I and I get that there are really good kids out there at, at 14, at 15, that have have gone through the process and they've been training since they were that big. Um, there's a kid from. Uh, uh, Zach Garbett's Willie Castle's gym. He's that ten-year-old kid. What's his name? He's brilliant. Yeah, uh, uh, no, Prochesso, a project. Yeah. Ah, oh, he's amazing. That kid. Yeah, you, you tell me that by the time he gets to fourteen, he's not going to be ready to fight full rules. He probably is, and then some. However, as soon as you let that fourteen-year-old child do full rules, or even head contact, then you've set a precedent. And law is set on precedents. Law is set on legal cases. So that 14-year-old child does. So Billy, Billy Bobbins, who has a crap Muay Thai gym down the road, whose kids are nowhere near as well-schooled, and you know who the good gyms are. You go to bad company. You've, my kids are fighting somebody from bad company. They've got a hard fight. They fight somebody from GFC. They've got a hard fight. They fight somebody from Kiat Fonset. They've got a hard fight. You know who the good gyms are. And you also know which gyms are absolute garbage you know the gyms were well, the the standard is not very good okay but the 14 year old kid doing head contact or a class that's the precedent so that kid can do it and that kid is probably going to get hurt not the really talented kid and people lose sight over that i'm going to tell you about a skiing example because uh, obviously I used to work in schools and we used to go off and we used to take kids. i uh, been to trips to Disneyland, Germany, France and everything. And there was an example given to us. There was, a, there was a kid who went skiing. This was in a sixth form school. He went skiing from year seven through to year 13. Okay, And every year he went skiing. He'd skied loads of times on his own anyway with his family. And from year seven, he was an expert skier. He skied all the way through. Um, until he was in year 13. This was two days, got, they got there to resort, and he was two days before his 18th birthday. The kid, uh, the kid, first day of skiing, they all together said, right, you're in small groups, off you go. The kid, because he was an expert, went off piste. Okay? Got back to the hotel that night. 
the 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 head of the the whole trip, uh, not the head of the school, the 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 senior leader in charge of the trip said said to the kid, don't do that, don't go off piste, because if you don't know what off piste is, if you if you're going on piste, you're going on where there's a track. If you go off piste, you don't know what's coming. There could be a fall, a dip. The the there's no piste bashes to make sure that the the piste is smooth. If you go off piste, it's incredibly incredibly dangerous. But this kid is 17 years, 363 days old. He knows what he's doing. Goes off piste. The next, so the next, uh, so the the head of the thing says, don't go off piste again. If you go off piste again, you're in trouble. The next day is the day before the kid's 18th birthday. The kid go, off with his group, goes skiing, goes off piste, f uh, skis off a mountain and dies. The day before the kid's 18th birthday. He, the teacher who was in charge of the whole trip was sent to prison because the court found that he should have taken the lift pass off, off him because he was still a child and wasn't able to make his own decision. And then you look at in tie boxing and kickboxing and they're whacking each other in the head from 12, 13, 14 years of age. And that's, you're saying that's informed consent. We live in a very legal world, and it's only a matter of time before there's a fatality. I mean, the Scott Marsden thing was supposed to have changed things, and in reality, it's not. If anything, recently, it's gone back to the way that it was, because there are more kids now doing, with different groups now doing officiating, there's more kids fighting, non -head, uh, fighting head contact at a younger age than ever before. Your opens now, opens it. Eight-year-old, Kev. Eight to ten categories. Doing net concerts. It's, it's barbaric. I mean, I've seen a lot of stuff that Gary Turner's done about CTE. Um, and the fact that the FA are not teaching kids to head a football. Head in a football until ten. Because of the premature onset of dementia with uh, ex-professionals. So that's just head in a ball. Can you imagine? And, and, and the thing is, it's all right now. And there's a lot of people on Facebook who have extremely strong views about, oh, it's fine, we live in a namby-pamby world, it didn't do me any harm. Yeah, but let's have a look at what it's like when you're 60 and you can't speak and you die of dementia. That's the danger. And, and the thing is, you can't recover from a concussion. The concussion stays with you forever. And moving it to 16, yes, there are kids. The, the kid from Pro who who is 10, he could, he could fight probably, he could go to Thailand and fight now. But there's different rules in Thailand. In Thailand, I can ride a motorbike without a helmet. But in the UK, if I do that and the police catch me, I'm going to get it done. I can't. Is, is it a matter rules. of time, Kev, before you're walking through your shopping centre and the guy there with a clipboard says, have you been involved or your kids been Injury involved? Injury lawyers for Thai boxing. In, easy. Any ring sports? Have you done any ring sports? And have you, you get a concussion? Out? Have you been knocked out? And who's Quite. that going to come back to? And if you're not insured... You better sell your house. It's it's a bad state of affairs, but that that, is that that's the we live in a very legal world. We live in a very legal world. Like American and football. American football. And and the the the, the money nine nine out of ten people in America go bankrupt because of uh, health healthcare. We got the NHS. It was the grand, it was the, um, the the election yesterday, and they were about. We did so last night. Yeah, we like, <laughs> and uh, the Conservatives uh, let's hope they don't sell the NHS off. But if Nine out of ten people in America go bankrupt because of healthcare, right? It, it staggers the what's around the corner for for young adults. And bearing in mind, when a lot of us, when we started fighting, we came to it late. I started training at fourteen, and and my brain, even though it was I was, even though I was fighting from an early age, it wasn't really developed properly until I'm, until my uh, past my teen years into my formative early years. And kids from a very young age are getting repeatedly punched in the face. It's only a matter of time before there's a legal case brought against a group or an individual. And it'll come out, no doubt about it, it will come out. And there will be somebody that gets uh, a plaintiff letter uh, landing on the door. It's only a matter of time. Um, the government bans that have come in, we were very close to coming into a government ban, and if you don't believe me, ask Claire Heap. She's incredibly vocal on this. Um, she knows a lot more about this than I do, but in government bans, uh, we look to fall into line. We get to, unless we start becoming safer, we run the risk of having a ban placed on our sport. Early 2000, the French, and the French were the best Muay Thai nation in the world outside of Thailand. And the French came in 2000, no Thai boxing. 
It's too barbaric. And even now when Pinker and Skabowski and all them, they fight, well, Skabowski not anymore, but Pinker, fights in France, they have to fight in elbow pads. If you fought kickboxing, you had to fight in moon boots. And this is this is a while ago, I'm not sure what it's like now. You had to fight in foot pads and kickboxing shorts. And if you fought Muay Thai, you had to have my Muay Thai shorts because they didn't want to distinguish the two. And you had to have elbow pads so that they knew what the, the differential was. And in 2000, the French came in and banned it. In Holland now, there's no ring sports until 18. And you've got to register everything on an app um, for to say who you matched with. Uh, as soon as Holland banned ring sports, uh, Belgium followed suit and Spain followed suit. Are we going to be next? So in summary, if you want to become part uh, and fall into line with this for three pounds a year, that's it, three pounds a year per person, three pounds a year to become part of the BKC. You can put these things into practice. You get the safety and the help of the BKC. Um, go to the the BKC website and download your safeguarding starter pack. The next bit that needs to come into this is safer competition. The things that we've talked about privately about uh, making sure that well, the, the thing that you currently do now, which is uh, about two kilograms and within the age ranges as well. I personally think it should be in academic school years because you could have a kid who is in say, for example, year seven, the bottom of year seven, who's fighting a kid who's year nine, no, year eight, who's in the top, who's at the, uh, the bottom end of year eight, and physiologically the miles apart, but school age is, is better for me. Um, I've got a big thing as well about weighing in as well, um, as a safeguarding thing about kids stripping off and weighing in in front of adults in their underwear. So I've, I think as well, for safer competition as a safeguarding issue, all kids should be wearing in, wearing in the tie boxing shorts, a vest, something very light, but certainly, and, and something that I don't and allow. And we, and we just alter the weight. Yeah, it's, it's only a fraction. A and people are, people are losing sleep over this fraction of a weight and they come slightly over because they've got a vest on mm. or they're in the tie boxing shorts. It's not the end of the world. In BJJ, you put your full equipment on and then get on the scales mm. and then you weigh in. And that, that, that highlights which category you're placed into for your weight division. Now, I'm not saying we do that, but I don't like the idea and something that I don't do in the gym. If you're a child, you're not allowed to take your shirt off in the gym because you're just not. An adult can take the shirt off because it's your decision. But as a child, you're not taking your shirt off in the gym because you don't. I, I'm very fortunate in the fact that I love loads of parents and loads of parents support, but I don't want parents coming in because you don't know what they're thinking. You don't know the motivation of, uh, of people. So if there could be a parent who sat in a gym looking at a child and it's really hot, can I take my shirt off? I'm really hot, Kev, can I take my shirt off? No, leave it on. Yeah, but he's taking his off. Yeah, but he's an adult. And that's the distinction. Because the, the, the child is at risk and that can lead the door uh, for abuse. Safe, safe competition. All, all gyms kite mark registered. If the kite mark registered, you're safe. And then that makes a huge relief for you, knowing that the gyms that you're dealing with all have all the fighters covered. They've got insurance. Everybody's got safety.